Hi kids, welcome to the Harvard Grace Art Collective's Read Aloud. I'm reading from my home to yours. My name is Kame Murphy and I'm reading a story about Billy John 13 by myself, Kame Calloway Murphy, and illustrated by Stuart Hudgens. So we thank everyone who's involved with this book for allowing us to read this book to you. Billy John XIII was a slave boy. This is a picture of him. He knew that he had an unusual name, but it had a family meaning because he was the 13th child of his mother, Mabel and his father, William John. They all lived and worked at the Miles Plantation on Chesapeake Bay. Billy John 13 was very satisfied with his life. He did odd jobs around the plantation, such as gathering chips and twigs to start a fire, bringing the baskets of wet clothes for his mother to hang on the line, and sweeping the large veranda at the big house. The job he loved best was taking a net and walking along the shoreline to gather sand crabs, clams, mussels, nettles, starfish, and seaweed for his mother to use in the kitchen for making her a potent serum for anybody sick on the plantation. This is a picture of the family, of Billy John 13's family. He loved doing this chore because he could watch the ships on the bay and pretend that he was part of the crew moving the big ships across the waters. Now that Billy John 13 was 11 years old, going on 12, he had some concern because he knew that his father wanted him to join his brothers and sisters in cutting down trees and clearing the grounds around the Miles Plantation for farming and building. And here's a picture of one of the older brothers clearing the plantation. The other day, before supper, his father said, Billy John 13, you look big enough and strong enough to handle an ax. Papa put the ax in the boy's hand, and Billy John let the ax slip from his fingers, and it fell on his father's toe. Ouch! Molasses on catfish cakes, yells his father. Oh! He hobbled to the house to wrap his toe in sea moss and turpentine. His father later warned him, You better think about what you're doing, boy. Billy John 13 sensed that he'd better not try that again, and that his days near the water were growing short. He was destined for the woods. Storms on the Great Day Bay were bad for ships, but great for the boys' nets. A recent storm had left piles of food and medicines for the catching. Billy John 13 approached a large pile and then stepped back quickly, almost frightened, because in the center of the pile was something bright and clear reflecting the sunlight. It was a clear glass bottle. Billy John 13 had not seen many glass things in his 11 years. Everything in his cabin was tin or wood or clay. Glass was rare and only for the big house. He circled the bottle almost like an ancient ritual, looking at it from all angles. It was beautiful. Finally, he reached in the pile and grabbed the bottle by the neck. He held it high into the light and marveled at the transparency, the reflections, and the smoothness of the bottle. Billy John 13 looked across the waters and wondered where it came from. The sun was almost setting by the time Billy John 13 filled the neck and dragged it with the bottle toward his cabin. Here's a picture of the glass bottle. He smelled the corn foam cooking on the stove and noticed that his mother was mashing turnips. The Miles ate their main meal earlier in the day and Maybelle would go back later to serve a light supper. 
She glanced at her youngest son and sensed that he wanted to tell her something. She could hear her other children coming from the woods. Maybelle asked, What you been up to? What that in your hand? Billy John had lovely white teeth and long, silky eyelashes. She somewhat favored her youngest son, Billy John 13, so she asked, What that you got? It's a bottle, Mammy, a sure enough glass bottle. It's worth something, the boy announced, holding up the bottle for his mother's inspection. Mmm, better put that in the dark corner till, you, till your father gets here. The dark corner of the cabin was the coldest part of the cabin. Freshly killed rabbits and squirrels sometimes hung <clears throat> in the dark corner. It was near the bedrolls where 15 people slept in the small cabin. Billy John 13 carefully set the bottle down when the 12 siblings burst through the door, hungry and noisy. Everyone was cleaned up and seated when Papa came in and sat at the head of the table. His oldest son sat at the foot of the table and his youngest son, Billy John 13, at his right with his wife, Maybelle, on his left. Billy John was too excited to eat and was just picking at his food. His father, William, observed his youngest son and then asked, What's wrong with you, boy? Don't start up nothing, because you got one whipping coming from dropping that axe on my foot. He, he found something down by the water that might be worth something, Maybelle announced. Oh, what is it? William asked. It's a bottle, a clear glass bottle, whispered Billy John 13. The words bottle and clear glass went from child to child at the table. Where are that? questioned his father. In the dark corner, the boy replied. The children began rising in their seats to get a glimpse of the bottle. Everyone sit down, Papa announced. Finish dinner, Clean up. We'll look at the bottle after prayers. It seemed forever until Papa finished praying for strength to clear the woods, good health for Mabel, blessings for the Miles family, and on and on. Now, Papa said, about to see a bottle. The children were straining their eyes to see the bottle in the dark corner. Papa mentioned to Billy John 13 to get the bottle. Billy John held the bottle up for all to see. A wave of oohs and ahs went out from the children. It sure is pretty. That's worth something. Can we keep it? What we gonna do? Papa cleared his throat. This here bottle is going up to Master Miles first thing in the morning. But why, saw Billy John 13, tears beginning to cover his long black silky lashes. Papa said, this here place, all this belongs to the Miles family. And if you find something on somebody's place, it belongs to them. Billy John cried, but I found it and the water put it there. Master Miles don't own the water. The children were shaking their heads and making sucking sounds with their lips. The children favored the ownership of Billy John 13. It's settled, stated Papa. When I say it's settled, it's settled. Billy John spent a restless night. He was tempted to take the bottle and put it back in the water, but he thought about Papa's toe and decided to obey his father. Next morning, Billy John's 13's older brother Moses, who cared for the horses, said that Master Miles was at home in the big house. No one had come to take out the horses. Billy John 13 saw his father looking nervous and kind of beaten down as he tapped on the back door of the plantation. Master Miles came to the door himself and said, Oh, William John, Glad you came by. I was going to send for you. They moved into the small study where a desk was covered with letters and bills. Master Miles picked up the paper. 
You know, William, there is a war going on, this war of 1812. Prices are high and everything has lost value. I'm going to have to sell a few of the slaves in order to make ends meet, and especially those slaves who are not producing much. Then this notice came that some of the boatmen are looking for young boys to work on the ships. They're willing to buy boys as young as 11 or 12 years old. They will pay $36 for each and sell them back later for $50. I'm afraid I'm going to have to sell this lad here and maybe the one next to him to work on the boats. Papa looked confused. He muttered, Get, give up my boys, sell my boys. Billy John 13 heard the words work on boats and his heart leaped with joy. Master Miles continued. And then about this 1812 war, they have conscripted me to go fight the British. But you know how sickly Mistress Miles is, so I can send a slave in my place. Therefore, I have placed your oldest son Moses on the 1812 conscription list. He may or may not have to go, but he will be trained and able to defend America. You'll be mighty proud. Now, what did you want me about, asked Ma Master Miles. Papa seemed overcome and unable to speak. Billy John 13 stepped forward. Sir, I found this glass bottle at the shore. Papa said that it belongs to you because you own the land, the shore, the water, everything. Master Miles laughed. You are spunky. I don't know about everything, but yes, this is a very fine bottle. Maybe I can use it to buy you back from the waterman. Master Miles had warm feelings for William John and his family. They were good workers and faithful. Billy John 13 tugged on his father's pants. Master Miles, William asked, can Billy John 13 hold the bottle one last time? Master Miles handed the bottle to Billy John 13, who moved out into the marble floored foyer to hold it to the light. Then there was a loud crash. The crash sounded like a cannon rocket shot at Fort McHenry. The glass bottle went scattering to the floor like shrapnel. Mrs. Miles entered the room. What was that? she asked. She spied Billy John 13. Oh, he's the one with the beautiful smile and long silky eyelashes. She handed him a cookie. Maybell rushed in with the broom and dustbin. Master Miles looked pale and shaken. Uh, you all can go, he announced. Nobody seemed to notice that Poppy, Papa and Billy John were going out the front door. May Maybell pursed her lips toward her young child, asking, Why you do that? Billy John 13 stood at the door. He glanced at the waters of the bay. Billy John looked at his mother and father's troubled face. He remembered what his brothers said about their coming in chains across the water. He didn't know why he had dropped the bottle. But, but he knew it had something to do with freedom. The end.